Welcome to Access to Perspectives Conversations, the podcast for bridging academic landscapes. At Access to Perspectives, we provide novel insights into the communication and management of research. Our goal is to equip researchers around the world with the skills and enthusiasm they need to pursue a successful career. You will get insights around the topics of scholarly reading, writing and publishing, career development, project management and research integrity, all embedded into open science practices. Learn more about our work at accesstoperspectives.org. Welcome, everyone. And today we have Lucia Benkovicova with us. Warm welcome, Lucia. It's great to have you. Thank you. you. Thank you for having me. (laughs) All right. So um, we met on LinkedIn, actually, through uh, posts and then commenting back and forth. And um, but to give a little bit of background, I will read from your bio to introduce you. So you you were born in Galanta, Slovakia. A graduate student in architecture from the Slovak University of Technology and in computer science from the Pan European University, um, with both universities being in Bratislava, Slovakia. You studied in Austria, Germany, France, England, and Hungary, and and lectures were we come to talk about that. Um, as I mentioned, it in the respect of national languages. Um, and your main uh, employment or your main capacity now is in publishing, which is what we're going to talk to uh, talk about today. Mm-hmm. Where you are busy editing articles, sending book publishing, proofreading, and managing the whole publishing workflow. Um, you also evaluate research projects for Horizon Europe and the Slovak Research and Development Agency, mm-hmm. and give lectures on the security of public spaces, open access, artificial intelligence, and virtual reality. Um, You also have a few articles and two books, which we also link to in the show notes, and are probably also listed in your archive profile. And um, your, your own research now focuses on crime prevention through environmental design and virtual reality, which is also very interesting to talk about so hopefully we we'll hear from hear a little bit about that as well um okay. <laughs> and yeah we're now mostly busy well an architect in it uh, civil engineering architecture and pra- no you're practicing architect- architecture through civil engineering and it um mm-hmm. on a professional capacity outside academia that is so yeah and now let's hear from you. So, I mean, that already gave like a snapshot of, of several mm-hmm. um, stations in, in your career, stages and stations. But um, now over to you. So what, like, what, what would be interesting to hear about all of the above in more mm-hmm. detail and explicitly like what's your perspective and your journey that brought you to where you are and what makes you being passionate and dedicated to the disseminating dis- dissemination of research mm-hmm. especially with all the um highly interesting and um well yeah the, the research themes and topics that you personally care about and engage in and uh, also mm-hmm. managing through the publishing yeah so thank you for the introduction well, uh, I'm really, uh, really passionate about research. And uh, it's been many years. Uh, I happened to you know, get out of academia a few years ago. And then I spent like uh, six years in practice. And I got back to the university like three years or four years ago um, to manage this journal of ours that we uh, turned to a scientific journal. And yeah, and so. Uh, about the research uh, fields uh, I'm interested in, it uh, started really with architecture, the civil engineering, and uh, I also did a PhD um, at the Slovak University of Technology. So and I spent here like nine years, and then I went on to work here for several months, and then I then I uh, started a new job. And there was a new opportunity, and uh, in between I studied part-time this uh, 
information technologies and computer science and everything and try I started to try to combine it all together and then I got back and got another opportunity to also um, uh, work as an uh, expert reviewer for Horizon Europe uh, which was really uh, great and new so I'm doing it for the second year now and I'm also lecturing at the university, uh, as you mentioned. So it's all mostly it's mostly connected to to the writing, research writing, and open access, and but also my expertise, for example, in the security of public places, and also virtual reality, and now also artificial intelligence. I'm brushing it a bit, <laughs> mm. and um, yeah, and about the book publishing, uh, since uh. We are as a publisher are based uh, at the university. Then we also publish books. We have a very big publishing house so that unfortunately publishes books mostly in Slovak. But we also uh, uh, want to start uh, maybe uh, provide some books in open access, uh, not just uh, these articles. And there are of course more several faculties uh, at the university that also have their own scientific journal, they are mostly open access. So uh, this is basically really the, the tendency, the trend that uh, we also try to follow. And it's uh, it's really a good thing. So nice. we will come to it in more details later. <laughs> yes. So maybe mm -hmm. um, because of your, or, or referring back to your personal expert or professional expertise on a, with a personal interest, twist mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um what what's your research focus on civil engineering and public spaces um in it what's the connection there mm -hmm. yeah, so uh, there is a specific term yeah. that actually originated uh, in america it's uh the it's a related septet it's um an acronym for crime prevention through environmental design mm -hmm. it's basically how the architect and also some different fields like uh, police and policy makers and some other experts, criminologists, psychologists, sociologists, etc. Uh, what they basically can do to prevent crime, but not in a you know, way that uh, you just uh, put on fences and high walls and things like that, but some more or uh, some better alternatives that would be more suitable for life in general okay so there is a lot of research behind that and there is also the initiative uh, that is similar to this one in america and it's called uh, designing out crime it's basically in uh, london and united kingdom and here in europe it's mostly now designing out crime mm -hmm. okay and yeah and uh, i was um uh, specialized in maybe buildings for living and public spaces, etc., etc. Et but uh, this can also go farther in really in details like door handles and some specific design features and everything. So, but yeah, okay. uh, my research was focused mostly on public spaces. Yeah, I remember like okay, I'm I'm a born and raised Berliner in Germany. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes. Currently, we are rare species nowadays. But mm -hmm. what I was gonna say more about is we have a few public spaces that tend to mm -hmm. be populated by yeah, and um, drug mm -hmm. trafficking and so on. And mm -hmm. from what I've heard in the news, what the city then how the city then intervened with researchers backing is to set up cameras well that's one thing to monitor mm -hmm. yes exactly. also to mm -hmm. set up um light bulbs just to to put some you know to to avoid dark corners you know things. yes mm -hmm. construct buildings in such a way mm -hmm. that you don't have like shady shade or mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. corners where it's easy to kind of hide and then mm -hmm. yeah so it's, it's yeah. more of a kind of user-centric design approach in a way Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, yes. architecture is uh, always about that it's tailored to the specific place, otherwise it's really not architecture. So okay. yeah, yeah, I also researched, researched some uh, initiatives and practices in Germany, so I know that uh, you often use these cameras and <laughs> these circuit TVs and everything. 
But yeah, I think that really with the architecture, mm -hmm. which has failed, that you need the cameras to monitor and observe. Yeah, so, yeah. So there is, uh, there is something that architects can influence right from the start, from when they start designing the city or specific places, of course. Mm -hmm. Now you don't have so much opportunities to design like uh, cities completely from scratch, right? <laughs> but so it's mostly about some revitalizations and some reconstructions now, but yeah. And adaptation. There is really direct link that architecture really contributes to the level of crime. So you really and need to. And consider it yeah and the virtual reality part the vr part is that to 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 basically test and pilot what's then to be implemented or how's it something like that i actually started so uh, and i already finished uh, like after two years uh, developing an application um for education purposes i also published an article about it so it's uh, mostly about uh, there is a specific project and there are some specific tasks uh, you can do as a student, mostly as a student or as an architecture practitioner to practice and to think about some things that you should consider in the design. Mm -hmm. So basically you can walk around some some area uh, there is also buildings you can enter if you want to and there are some specific tasks to do especially in the outside since so i'm focused on public spaces and so uh, really just uh, basically some notifications some text uh the task to follow and you are basically doing it more times and each time from a different perspective first you need to think uh, as a positive user of the uh, space and then also as a villain as maybe if you want to rob someone or something what would you do what would change in oh, the perspective yeah so you can go through it and you know experience it before it so uh, actually happens so you say they say that's also maybe safer and depends of course it's like so, role plays in a way so is mm -hmm. it easy to get into a gaming mode or can you always keep the researcher point of view mm -hmm. Uh, well, it's always a bit uh, in a gaming mode. It's not really that uh, you are uh, like um, uh, getting any points or <laughs> like uh, in a game, but uh, you know, it, there, it's, there's always some game mode in any virtual uh, reality application. Of course, you know, it's different interface and everything, but it's not really like you are achieving any special task and getting any rewards <laughs> for it. So, yeah. Mm. Of course, it's also made for adults and for mostly for specialists. So it's not really a game for everyone, at least for not for now. So we will see maybe in the future we can. Yeah. Make it I was also thinking when you're actually doing the experiment and doing the virtual mm -hmm. perspective change, if it's if you then mm -hmm. find yourself in like really engaged in that role that you then have in the VR setting. But um, well, this specific situation really is about uh, about the birding, and now, now when I just say one sentence there, then it really changes, and something just clicks in your mind. That, oh, okay, I need to think really differently right. here. Exactly work. Yeah. yeah. So it's something like that. It's not really like right. there is something some drastic change, and uh, something changes. it's oh, not really. Yeah. But hopefully. Uh, we will also try to test it more, so we will see, and we will have some free feedback from the students and maybe also teachers, hopefully some researchers, uh, maybe starting here at the uh, university, and then we probably also yeah. can offer it to the public. Yeah, well, it's good that you say that, because, I mean, the listeners who are mm -hmm. not researchers might think, oh, it's all about playing game and research, and what's with mm -hmm. all money. Yeah. But no, it's actually serious stuff here, even though it's all... Yeah. It can really get uh, really intense, even uh, though that everyone thinks that research is so unemotional and everything. But it's really, it's especially when people are so passionate about what they are doing, then you can see it and you can feel it in everything. So, mm. okay. So since we mentioned that you went through a whole lot of countries throughout your career, uh, yeah. and you <laughs> engaged in the studies in the respective national languages. How easy and difficult was mm -hmm. it for you to learn these languages, so then actually follow the lectures? And I'm asking that because I have my mm -hmm. own experience with Swedish. Yeah. Uh, but of course, English is all our, well, our, in this case, mm -hmm. um, first or whichever number, um, second language or third. Mm -hmm. uh, but then 
besides English and then another and yet another language. How did that go? Mm -hmm. uh, actually, I st spent a lot of uh, a lot of years studying uh, languages also during grammar school and when I was at primary school. So actually before I applied to some scholarship abroad when I was a PhD student, I already had a very good uh, knowledge of languages. Of course, English is probably my best. I'm also doing proofreadings and I really got a certificate in advanced English and everything. And the other languages, uh, really, uh, um, maybe I also delved more into it you know, when I um, became a PhD student. So that was uh, 13 years ago now, right? Or 14 years ago, in, even. And then we also have some extra uh, language practice and everything. And so uh, I always liked languages and you know, uh, actually, recently I also started learning Italian because I'm going to yeah, play a tennis tournament there in two months. <laughs> so, <laughs> wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, about Germany, it's also for me very familiar because I spent many years uh, like practicing the language. And then at the, uh, when I was a PhD student, I realized that French is very you know, similar, for example, to English when you think about it, because uh, basically 70% of English words come from French. Of course, the pronunciation and grammar is different, but uh, when you read the text in French, you can basically also mm. uh, understand a lot, even though if you, if you don't know the proper pronunciation and things like that. But uh, so about the multilingualism is also about the order of languages you, you know, start to learn. So really, if you know English really well, then it's quite easy to start learning French, for example. But maybe uh, the difference between Chinese and I don't know, German, it's uh, so, so great that it would, of course, it would be much more difficult. Mm. And then uh, the, the Slovak, no, sorry, the <laughs> Slovak, no, Slovakia, Slavic sorry. languages, sorry. Yeah. Um, how's that going? Do you understand Slovenian? Croatian. Um, actually, I, I was in Slovenia uh, last year, also playing a tennis tournament, and uh, actually, I understood quite a lot, mm -hmm. uh, especially in writing. And in Croatia, it's a bit different, but certainly, and there are some funny words actually that seem to be common, but it, there is a completely different meaning in the language. <laughs> all right <laughs> and yeah so it can be really difficult and if people don't realize that it's uh, not meant like this it can they can even get angry or something you know so it's really worth to maybe get at least get some basic vocabulary because you can get into troubles <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah maybe it's not so so what well, such different meanings between german german and austrian german and then swiss german but mm -hmm. we do have our misunderstandings also, and then we're mm -hmm. very specific to either country. Mm -hmm. The others don't get like, what are you talking about? Oh, that's yeah, funny. yeah. I know about it. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's funny. Wait. Yeah. Right. So now, um, in your current capacity and role as a journal editor and mm -hmm. early article and book publishing, what are your favorite activities? Ah, uh, it's really difficult to ask questions for me, like, uh, what is your favorite, anything? Or because... least favorite, what's your least favorite part of the job? Mm -hmm. Which it's really difficult. Yeah, it's really difficult because I've always liked uh, almost everything, like also at school, all the subjects and everything. There is always something that, I'm, that I am curious about, you know, and um, it's really difficult. and. But still, I always, uh, I've always done also many activities, uh, and some, so it's quite diverse for me. And maybe I like it, but it's, it, that it's so diverse. But I'm also fine if I need to do some administrative work. You know, my mom actually worked uh, for many years in a court in, as an administrative work. You know, so maybe it's in my genes. But really, I, I don't think that I have a problem with anything. Of course, there are sometimes some personal issues, some different goals, and some people don't realize some things, but it's uh, maybe it was about communication, but otherwise, yeah. Mm. 
or is there any anything in the workflow that you wish was easier because it is so important, but then what people often refer to as the system makes it difficult? Hmm. Oh, maybe uh, there are also always usually tight deadlines for everyone. You know, we try to do uh, everything we can to like provide more space and time for everyone. But yeah, it's kind of really, really tricky because it's a change, chain of activities. And, you know, you, if there is a delay in one of them, it's just spreads through the whole chain and it uh, can get difficult. But of course, it's uh, mostly the role of the good manager and leader for the journal so to handle it but yeah the deadlines uh, there are right. actually we, but we have never had any problems uh especially since i'm here since i'm back to the university with the publishing deadlines and anything but yeah it's it's of course it's tough for everyone mm. True. um okay so what's the state of open access in slovakia at the moment How's mm. X is going? Is there a lot of paywalls in the way that, or is is open access basically mainstream and generally adopted already? Or also in that regard, maybe that's a separate mm -hmm. question. Just to put it out there into the country, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how um the adoption of publishing in Slovakian journals in Slovak, mm -hmm. um versus feeling the pressure on the researchers and also side to publish in English and American journals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, we realized that English is uh, the language of the world. So, of course, we switch to it uh, very soon. <laughs> and the sooner I do it, the better for you if you really want to do an international research and made it also make it more, more accessible to uh, other people. So, we are fine with it. Um, you can see that we are quite good with foreign languages. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, well, the state of open access in, of course, we are quite a small country, so uh, I won't really, uh, like, um, um, mention other countries and compare it to other countries. And, of course, there are some associations. Um, there is actually a Slovak National Initiative for Open Access, and they are really good, doing a really good job. And they are also you know, providing courses. They are also uh, went through the process of certification so that they can uh, basically lecture about open access here and everything. And so uh, they are providing really many materials from different countries, from all the initiatives from all over the world. And they are going, but they are also doing translations of the leaflets and everything. You can get free consultations. Uh, they list the journals they are you know, publishing in open access and there are so many many services uh, basically mostly coming from this national institution and of course uh, the motivation is probably mostly for researchers and universities so they are all involved in it and of course now if you want to get also some serious funding it's uh, normally required that you publish open access so it's okay it's normal yeah so there's also political support, in other words. And yeah, there is certainly is, yeah. I see demands and and are there still like it's not easy for every individual, assume mm -hmm. in Slovakia to learn uh, another language. Is there so like or what what would be your guess on the percentage in English speaking journals even within the country versus Slovak language? No, what? <laughs> Mm -hmm. Well, I personally have no idea. <laughs> I have no exact. But there are still quite a few. But, but I am sure that uh, all the open access uh, journals are probably or switched to English or started to publish in English. Yeah, I would say that this is probably the situation. Of is course, that... there. Mm -hmm. I was just going to add because I know for Indonesia, they are very. Mm -hmm of making a point in publishing and mm -hmm. Indonesian. I think the language has another name. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. in, in the local language. And mm -hmm. um, I know that also because I'm managing Africa mm -hmm. Archive and there we received quite a few things uh, yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. in Indonesian, which was mistaken mm -hmm. by Rina Archive to submit. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But um, 
So that could also be an option for um, mm -hmm. Slovakian researchers to share their mm -hmm. preliminary or to be published then maybe later in English uh, in Slovak on a preprint so and then also the oh paper. well there are certainly uh, some journals that uh, publish maybe just English abstracts and then you can basically oh. uh, the rest of the paper is for example in Slovak but now for example with Google Translate you can easily even uh, translate documents for free for so I don't think that it's really such an issue uh, for today but I'm sure that who can uh, of course switch to English because Slovak is so really uh, uh, not really uh, spoken with many people in the world so of course if you want to uh, get into serious research then English is a must I'm yeah. afraid I, I get you and I would like to add that it's also important to keep um, science communication in the region and local languages to engage mm. other, the other yeah. stakeholders. And also mm. because much research is for regional mm. context explicitly and purposefully, yeah. and therefore it should also be or can then therefore communicate in mm. the local language. And I think in many mm -hmm. Western European countries, we need to relearn and reappreciate that mm. Again, mm. because yeah, many have switched to English because of the pressure and the opportunity that comes yeah. with a global exposure. Mm -hmm. But I feel also, especially when it's local context research, a lot of the mm -hmm. information gets lost in translation because English just doesn't yeah. have, have the term, the terminology and the specificity of the mm -hmm. description, which you can very easily do in your own language. Mm -hmm. But not so easy. Yeah, they would really appreciate it. That's true. But of course, we try to do our best as everyone. But then I, I appreciate, like, let's say, you make it sound so easy, the whole multilingualism approach. And I think it can <laughs> be. And as a trainer and consultant, I mm -hmm. want to make it easy for others to also adopt. Mm -hmm. So I'm really yeah. delighted mm -hmm. and excited about your way of the the easiness conveying the message oh yeah, you just engage in multilingualism and off you go and this is how you do it but easy <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay it's just a matter i think it's also for many a mindset that yeah it's actually possible mm -hmm. and we have a lot of technological support nowadays mm -hmm. all right mm -hmm. so that's covered <laughs> what else um Open access, diamond, diamond open access. Is that a thing in Slovakia? Diamond yeah, open actually, uh, so actually our scientific journal is open access and it's also diamond. So oh. it basically means that uh, the authors and also uh, reviewers are not paid and uh, they also there are also no fees. Of course, uh, for the publication, everything, uh, all our services are completely for free. We even provide uh, uh, free English proofreading, but it's usually not part of a demo open access, so there is uh, something extra. And yeah, since uh, we can afford it as a university because uh, we get some donations, uh, some subsidy from the ministry, mm -hmm. and uh, so that's why we can um, afford it and really any, uh, anyone can publish their research, of course, if they meet the selection criteria and if they get through the review process and everything. And yeah, this is basically what them and open access is about. It's, there are no fees included and... No fees, yeah. but there are fees, but they're not to be paid by the by the readers or publishers, uh, submitting authors, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, there are actually fees we, we of course, pay uh, we for, pay for the the page for the language proofreading etc but uh, it is completely free of charge for authors or reviewers and I don't even yeah well, that's great also that is another topic it could be so easy if people mm -hmm. get out of their box thinking and what mm -hmm. they used to or have become accustomed to mm -hmm. see as the only option where there's many other options to subsidize coal fund mixed revenue streams um taking yeah. holding on account other stakeholders like the ministries and the communal com what municipals 
Uh, I think there is always a way if you are really committed. Uh, yeah. Of course, it can get complicated, especially in the academia. And of course, there are some special procedures sometimes you need to follow. It, it can be really frustrating and everything, but there is always a way. Yeah. Okay, cool. Another big issue solved, just randomly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And uh, so what was the workflow? Um, because we, we got to talk about, as as I mentioned in the beginning, that we mm -hmm. get to know each other through LinkedIn, mm -hmm. which is a great networking tool, just randomly. And um, mm -hmm. But there's also other networking tools. But yeah, this is where we met. And mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and then you you commented on one of my... Or, or we both commented on a post. I can't remember which one it was. But so it was mm -hmm. about... Um, the director of open access journals where the journal is managing which is the architecture papers of the faculty of architecture and design at stu which mm -hmm. is the mm -hmm. technical yeah, it's, it's university, so university. Mm -hmm. um that that yeah so that that journal is also indexed with dodge how did that go what's the workflow for getting indexed in dodge mm -hmm. Uh, well, of course, first we set ourselves some goals and it was basically maybe decided before I actually uh, came <laughs> to work for the journal. But so I was basically uh, assigned a task um, to get the journal index in Dodge mm -hmm. by the deputy editor in chief. And he was that time uh, vice dean for research at our faculty. And of course, probably the first step I made was check their guide for applying and their official web page and the application forms and all the information that it's there compact in their course web page. Uh, so first you need to register. And of course, there are some criteria for inclusion. Uh, some of them are just basic. There are some special extra recommendations. There is quite a list, but and in general, the decision is reached uh, within three months. And if you want, maybe we can go through the criteria, just uh, maybe some bullet points. I actually have the, the page opened. So, of course, I must warn you that uh, we applied to the right like uh, two years ago. So there have been some small changes, but I am, I am uh, now uh, checking the current website. So, of course, you need to have a journal that is actively publishing scholar research, no matter the area of research, uh, you need to publish at least some some number of articles per, per year. Uh, then uh, the journal needs to be, of course, open access. So there are some definitions you can check. There are, there is a lot of information also about the copyright holders and licensing. We also need to deal with this. And of course, you have need to have a dedicated uh, web page uh, mm -hmm. and the home homepage that is accessible. Then each article is important. It needs to be basically in a PDF or HTML form as a minimum, right? And so uh, then, yeah, there, there were some criteria about the languages. So it's not really necessary to publish everything in English, but uh, there was um, one of the criteria was to uh, publish at least abstracts in English, uh -huh. as far as I remember correctly. And there are many, many recommendations of what you can do. So this index really like helps you to improve in all kinds of ways regarding open access publishing and research in general. Mm -hmm. So then, of course, you need to have published uh, open access policy, aims and scope. There needs to be a list of editorial board members course instructions for authors and yeah uh, they really made it clear that everything needs to be really transparent clear for for the person who doesn't really know how it works internally you know so it, it must be clear for everyone uh, there must be explicit mentions about the charges if you charge anything because it's not a problem for an open access journal if you charge a fee if you have a fee so it doesn't have to be, of course, demo open access, but uh, if there are any fees included, it needs to be stated clearly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course, the process and everything. Of course, some contact details, it's part of the professional web page. Yeah, need to, they needs to be a contact. Of course, your journal it must have also the international standard serial number. 
So you can check it online as well. Mm -hmm. And basically, you know, this proportion between the information, so complete integrity of all the information. Mm. And there is a then there is a quality control process. So they they have an editor and some editorial board. There are like hundreds of volunteers, and they basically pass through all these criteria, and then you get a decision. So our personal story was basically we sent the application uh, through the Doach page on twenty second of March, twenty twenty one. Yeah, twenty twenty one even. Yeah. And even though they receive like hundreds of applications every month, at least that's what they say at their web page, we already received some feedbacks the next day from the executive editor. So oh. we were quite surprised. But uh, then one of their uh, volunteers approached us uh, like two months later because there, there were some clarifications to be made. They found some conflicting information or maybe unclear enough. And it happened mostly because uh, we have a very long history of the journal dating back to 1996. Mm -hmm. And there were several, you can imagine, there were several changes that were introduced throughout the history. And we also flipped the journal in 2019. And then we became an open access journal. So there was also different uh, licensing um, requirements and some information and then we exchanged quite a lot of emails uh, throughout the three months and we even had a few calls before we got accepted on the 1st of July 2021 and the process itself was really rigorous but really really helpful mm. so I really recommend yeah, going through it uh, especially if you are maybe a smaller publisher uh, before you are indexed in Scopus on Web of Science because this really helps. So yeah. have your submissions increased and uh, since your index in Deutsch, you say that? Well, uh, so my original comment, yeah, it was uh, my comment on your uh, oh. post <laughs> on Deutsch, uh, was that we are honored to be indexed in Deutsch. And uh, one of the reasons is that they are the independent, non-profit, reputable, and prominent organization and mm -hmm. that we deem to be impartial. So in other words, more objective, which is highly valued in research. Yeah. Okay. Um, then we know that it's simply trendy and a vital part of the global open access infrastructure. Okay. And now we consider it really to be our strong, our strong partner that can be trusted and helps us achieve common goals, providing together the unique uh, service to the global society. Yeah. And yeah, great. So for us, it's really a milestone. I also posted mm -hmm. those on Facebook profile as <laughs> yes, our milestone. And um, this is really this Dutch criteria have become a gold standard for open access publishing. So mm -hmm. I think it's important to note. Um, then when you realize that they receive really hundreds of applications every month, and not everyone can get in, then uh, really, and um, this is basically the foundation at least the foundation in the indexation in the world scientific databases yeah it's also yeah. not only about the submissions well doach is also my my first reference point to to mm -hmm. researchers and early career researchers to, to, the mm -hmm. to choose a journal where to publish their research in but don't yes, exactly. you can mm -hmm. also use it as a literature discovery tool Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you also brush on it that it really helps to showcase your research and also get the citations you need to do, especially when you want to later get uh, indexed in scope and level of science. And really, it's um, of course, and services are free of charge because it's a non profit uh, organization, independent, and it really especially helps the smaller publishers, but also greater ones. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. So what's next? Um, is there other, so how's it with, because, well, one step at a time. The, the whole thing with scholarly publishing is published mm -hmm. research articles. There's now an increasing demand by funders, thankfully, um, to also publish mm -hmm. research data alongside and then in a fair manner. Is there mm -hmm. like a word, like in your current capacity, can you already cater for that to incentivize researchers to also share their data alongside? Um, or mm -hmm. is it for 
I don't know, in the next couple of years to be implemented. Because I know, like, mm -hmm. from an administrative and workflow point of view, it's quite a, mm -hmm. also for publishers, yeah. To yeah. but from a research integrity point of view, of course, it's also necessary or a must have, really. But the culture is mm -hmm. not there yet. So, what, what can you do with your journal to foster? Mm -hmm. that? Yeah, so we really try to improve in every way and we really try to consider all aspects of research and especially integrity uh, at the uh, university and the academia. It's really, really important. So I think we all realize it. Uh, if something happens, then it's uh, usually not intentional. So we try to also help the maybe starting authors and PhD students that often also publish with us to uh, realize this and to point to this because, of course, then Mm, there are so many advances also in these areas that it's very difficult to follow for everyone. So uh, that's why uh, we also I also try to uh, communicate more also with our employees and the students and so also to the general public uh, if I have some extra lectures. So to mm -hmm. yeah. All right. What's your vision for the next three to five years and how scholarly publishing and editing should evolve? What is the next um, next big big step for mm -hmm. well I wonder how the artificial intelligence <laughs> will uh -huh. be handled. Um uh, in research, of course, we already also uh, adopted some policy for using artificial intelligence in the research, and of course, it's going to evolve, and uh, we will pro uh, certainly see uh, many changes. And yeah, of course, there will be some positive ones and also maybe some negative ones. But yeah, I think this is uh, the biggest topic for the upcoming years. And of course, there are a lot of initiatives and also uh, some applications arising. So there, there will certainly be, be a lot of help also coming from the artificial intelligence, but also a lot of challenges. Yeah, what's the, what's the biggest support that you see can be delegated to AI in the editorial process? Hmm. It's really difficult because, oh uh, yeah, like our policy and the policy of most uh, the current journals on AI is that it's basically not allowed to uh, use it maybe also for reviews or uh, for some content uh, editing. Basically, I don't mean like uh, proofreadings, but uh, basically you can use it as a starting point maybe for, for your research. Oh, okay. Thank you so much, Lucia. This has been... <laughs> highly insightful and thanks for sharing all the tips and recommendations on multilingualism as well as on diamond of an access that can really be a no-brainer if you really want it to be one and obviously also for the recommendation on getting your journals index in Doge and for researchers to search through the director of open access journals to mm -hmm. find a journal to submit your own work to as well as um, for literature search Mm -hmm. yes. uh, so all the best for for your yeah ongoing and, and next steps in your mm -hmm. career and hope to speak to you soon again thank you yeah thank you very much and thanks for having me again <laughs> thanks for joining us to listen to this episode do let us know what you think you can email us or connect with us on our social media channels which you can find on our website at access to perspectives.org Email us at info at access to perspectives.org or book a call to explore how we can support you with your research planning, management and publishing. Welcome you again soon for our next episode. Until then, have a great time.